Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 251. Dos, cinco, uno. Dos, cinco, uno. All right, let's, my fingers are beginning to get weird there. But hey, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are fine. Good. I'm doing pretty well. As you can tell, I've got my running gear on right now. I'm about to head out for a run. Um, because why not? And I thought I'd squeeze in a little extra bonus episode of the podcast just to keep things rolling and to also expound on some um, other topics I wanted to speak about. More so streetwear news and all that sort of stuff and maybe catch up on some of the bits and bobs I missed out during the entire week. So I hope you guys are strapped in. Hope you guys have a nice drink to hand or, you know, you've had a nice smoke or maybe you've gone out for a little walk or maybe you've had that little pot of oatmeal that you get from pret a in the morning whatever it may be hope you're well fed well hydrated and as and you know and the most important thing your limbs are nice and loose you've got that mobility going on really well you can squat down with your heels to the floor and just rest just rest rest hope that's true anyway um here we are man 251 we're now on the other side of 250 you know i, I celebrated the 250 for a long time i went out and partied i hot bottles you know threw strippers off the side of a building you know i did loads of amazing things and now we're on the other side of 250 and i feel i feel quite serene i feel quite numb to pain um i feel quite numb to pleasure i also feel quite numb to happiness but that's a story for another day anyway um let's get into some topics i've got loads of to talk about number one something just came through my letterbox actually which is something i've been thinking about often there's a little handout, a little sheet they, they sent through my letterbox about um, the problems, the problem with homelessness. And I think it's in tying in with this app called Street Link. Have you heard this app? So I've got it here on the screen now called Street Link or something like that. So this just came through my letterbox. And I got me, it got me thinking, right, about the homeless situation in East London, especially Stratford near where I live. It's quite bad. Um, anyone that's lived, anyone that's been around this area knows that, you know, there's homeless people uh, basically... Um, covering the entirety of stratford from like maybe westfield station all the way until the front of the shopping mall all the way until the other side when you get to next to the morrisons and then sometimes up here where i live right so it's really crazy it's really really bad um it's got to the point where it's starting to make me wonder and think how they deal with homelessness um in the sit in london's what well, in the central of london the center of london um, you don't really see many people or many, yeah, you don't really see anyone, if anything, uh, sleeping inside the doorways of shops in inside central London. Maybe it's because of the foot traffic. Maybe it's because of the, um, the, the what you call it, the street wardens that come around and move people along. But I want to know what the laws are about sleeping rough, whether or not it's actually illegal to sleep rough, because it seems as if the people, in, the police officers in Stratford or whatever local authority don't necessarily want to move the homeless people on. Or maybe because the homeless people that are on the streets in Stratford are homeless people who have been, um, you know, who have been kind of moved around the whole of London. And this is probably where they've ended up. Or maybe there was a shelter somewhere around here in East London that's closed down. So that's effectively, uh, you know, left them nowhere else to, to stay or to live. So in some way, shape or form, the council feels responsible and they kind of let them kind of do what they want without kind of troubling anyone. I don't know, some some of you guys can maybe help me out and give me some direction about it, but it's really bad, especially next to the Morrisons. There's a little corner next to the Morrisons and there's like a Foxtons, I think, one of those kind of estate agents next to it. Uh, unfortunately for Foxtons, there's like a corner that links Foxtons and, and Morrisons, like a little, there's like a wall that links it together like that. And in that corner, they've essentially set up a little camp where they have essentially like, you know, someone bought them um tents and shit like proper nice tents so they've all got the same color tents i think three or four of them lined up against the wall and then there's a couple other dudes that sleep along the other side of the wall next to foxen so you know and foxen is a pretty posh um estate agents you know they have massive glass um tables and they have like an open plan area they have like a fridge where you can get a drink you know it's like it's quite modern it's quite hip so for them to have all these kind of random people, all these no, all these random homes people sleeping outside of it, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be happy about it. But I'm also just concerned about the homelessness people, the homelessness in Shafford in general for the people that live here, because it's just you know Shafford isn't the most accommodating place for people that are you know um, without uh, you know some kind of residential home. It, there's a lot of open areas. There's a lot of places where there's no lamps and no lampposts, no light. Um, there's not a lot of places with shelter. You left that to the elements. The kids around here aren't the most, you know, well behaved. That's that's putting it mildly. So it could be quite hazardous and dangerous for a homeless person. But um, in their infinite wisdom, UM Council have put this little um, sheet through my door 
And essentially, it sounds like they want us to fob in homeless people. They want us to kind of alert them to the problem, which is bizarre to say the least. Number one, it's bizarre to think that I'm going to fob in somebody for sleeping rough on the streets, not knowing what their life history was and what they had to go through. Number two, it's fucking ironic that they'd want us to do the work for them, right? It's like what I said before, like, you know, those restaurants you go to where you have to go and put the plate back and put the, the forks in a particular bin and, and fucking wipe your shit away in the, in the fucking pot somewhere, right? Like, no, I'm paying my money to come and eat in your restaurant. You have to serve me, right? That's how that kind of exchange goes, right? I come in with cash, you come with the plate and food. And you take it away when I'm done. It's just a common exchange. But some places have that weird kind of co-op community um, thing where we're kind of working together to make this place more harmonious. Get out of here. And I'm not going to fob in a homeless person. I'm not going to do it. But this sheet says the following. Um, rough sleeping and homelessness is an issue up and down the country. While the amount of people sleeping rough is on the decrease due to the hard work of outreach and other services, both in and around the council, this doesn't necessarily mean the homelessness isn't something that residents and the council should not try and worry about. Um, here are a few tips for residents who can help homeless people in the area. Residents are asked to ensure that they are they also report matters to the local police, safer neighborhood teams if they are coming across issues associated with rough sleeping, such as criminal damage and drug abuse. That's just an easy way to say four people in because if you if you think criminal um, damage and drug abuse isn't linked to homelessness, then you don't know what homelessness is, right? When you have nothing and you are, you know, essentially reduced to sleeping rough on the street, do you really think you give a shit about criminal damage or drug abuse and you want us, regular citizens, to go and fob these people in? Their life is hard enough as it is. Why am I going to add to the stress by calling? And who am I going to call? And who am I, what am I going to say? How am I going to give an identification of what they look like? Tell me, how am I going to identify homelessness? What am I going to say over the phone? What's going to be a discerning characteristic about them that's going to pin, that's going to, um, you know, um, allow you to to kind of spot them in a crowd of homeless people, especially in Stratford? It makes no sense. Like, it's absolutely insane. Like, the gumption of these people. It says, you should call 999 if a serious offense is in progress, just committed. If someone's immediate danger or harm, uh, if you're deaf or... Why are they even putting a 999 number in here? That This reminds me of the time when I called 999 because... um. Somebody on some sneaker forum scammed me for trainers. I went to buy some, no, I went to sell some trainers and some kids scammed me basically. Back in the day when you could scam people easily and you didn't have much knowledge, I was a fucking dumb nut. He scammed me, he got me, and I ended up sending the shoes without getting any kind of money confirmed into my account. Um, and yeah, I got scammed, right? So I got scammed, and then I remember, what do I remember when I got scammed? What was I talking about? Oh, I remember I got scammed and I panicked, right? I was like, shit, my, money, my money's gone. So I called the police <laughs> about a post office thing. And the woman on the other line was so fucking pissed off. She was giving me some rude answers. She was cutting me off. Like, she was really demonstrating to me how annoyed. Like, it, like you know, sometimes you, you have a, an experience with somebody that works in the service industry or, with a, with a, you know, someone on the telephone, wherever it may be. And you get the feeling like, you know, this person's having a rough day and they're taking it out on you. That wasn't it. She specifically was making sure that I knew that she specifically was making sure that I knew or that I was aware that I was a fucking dumb nut. And I think I was generally aware by the end of the phone call that I made a big mistake. And I was like, oh shit. Like, you know, when you hang up, you're like, you know, like when you hang up and you get blasted, I was like, uh, okay, cool. So I just kind of sucked it in. And then 10, 10 minutes later, some, another, I get a phone call from a withheld number and it's, I don't know, some police chief or someone you know at the top of that whatever center is that called who's basically apologizing and telling me sorry for the phone call so i think they were listening in when the phone call was made and they kind of be like i oh, know this woman went a bit too hard on you even though you were a fucking dickhead for calling us about your lost fucking trainers right um still she shouldn't say that to you it kind of reminds me of that but and i learned my lesson right i'm never going to call 999 again for lost mail but to put 999 here as a number on this sheet to do with homelessness is fucking irresponsible really for the most part um if you're deaf or have hearing impairment, call this number. Non-emergency, you can contact this number. And on the back, it's got this thing, right? Report to Streetlink. So this is the, the app, Streetlink. They want you. They want us to report homeless people, which is fucking nuts. So it says um, Streetlink enables the public to alert the council about people sleeping rough in the area. This is the first step that someone can take to ensure that rough sleepers are connected to local services to get the support that available to them. That is basically code words for. They, they, they're trying to make it acceptable for you to snitch or to fob in somebody that's homeless. That is disgusting. Who decided to make an app? How did they get away with this app? Especially now there's in, in the era of um, people being triggered and, you know, um, well, who was that recent terrorist from ISIS that everyone's got sympathy for? Like people are describing him as a scholar or some shit. I'm surprised those same people don't have an adverse reaction behind an app that's essentially allowing you to take a picture of someone that's homeless and send it to an authority. 
That is absolutely insane. It says here on the app, you can step one, see a rough sleeper. Um, you think about them. What does the bubble say? Um, what, what, what can I do to help? No one thinks that when they see a rough sleeper. Everyone just steps over them and keeps it moving. Why are they trying to go on as if people care? This is ridiculous. It's not a caring thing. You're doing it so they can get them off, the, off your streets because you don't want your, you know, your lovely little lawn to get fucked up. That's basically the reason why. Anyway, step two, open the street link app. Step three, enter the rough sleeper's details. What deals can you enter for them? What are you going to ask them? A national security number? You're going to ask them for a copy of their passport? Like, this is insane. <laughs> like, what are they doing? Number four, a professional, um, a professional will visit the area. So by the time you fob this person in on the app, they're going to get some send someone down to do what? To sit down with them, give them a cup of tea and shit, ask them if everything's okay, and then realize they're just, you know, they're one of the founders of homeless people in, 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 in fucking England who just fell on hard times. And there's nothing more that they can do for them because the service is obviously the way to kind of rehabilitate people or to reintegrate them back to society is pretty difficult, I think, isn't it? Anyone that's watched those documentaries will know the homelessness issue isn't, isn't kind of like a black and white issue. It's very, very blurry. Um, the consequences that lead to somebody getting that position in the first place. So, Honestly, like you can download a street link app on fucking iTunes. No, don't do that. Don't fob in your fellow street, your homelessness. Even though I still say the homeless situation in Stratford is fucking insane, I still don't think the residents should be, um, should be fucking, um, uh, what you call it, given a barrier in their back to fob in homelessness people. It should be the prerogative, you know what? It should be the prerogative responsibility of your local councilman. Like people that work in the council who are picking up a check. For essentially taking one bit of paper and putting it in another tray or photocopying stuff, right? Or adding fucking unnecessary red tape to procedures. They're the ones that should be concentrating on figuring out the issue. That's what you get paid for. To sit down and think of the bigger picture. How can we address this issue, right? It's an issue that's a societal issue. It's not just specific to East London or Stratford. But that's what you get paid for. That's what you get paid those big government wages and salaries for. Most of the time to do absolutely nothing. You should be concentrating and figuring out how to figure out the homeless situation. But you shouldn't be empowering local residents like myself to go and fob people in. Because I'm not going to do that. That is insane. Like, honestly, I, just, I was just thinking as well about homeless situation today in Stratford. Like, and then now I get this through the post. It's just like, what, is that a message? Well, I ain't listening, man. I ain't listening. Anyway, that's that's me angrily plopping down a bit of paper on the couch <laughs> in my um, in my double glazed apartment, carpeted, um, full of nice electrical gadgets. Like the irony, isn't it? The irony. Anyway, let's move on. Let's talk about some other interesting stuff that I thought was of interest on the internet that I've seen. Um, two five one. So number one issue to talk about here. What do you want to talk about? Um, yeah, this Krispy Kreme kid. Have you seen this this story? So this story broke, I think, a few weeks ago or a couple of days ago, maybe internet time. Um, this kid in the U.S. Um, essentially incredibly entrepreneurial. He will travel from one side of America to another side of America, really far places, in order to go to Krispy Kreme to go pick up some donuts and then to go re resell them back in, at, in in his hometown because essentially the nearest Krispy Kreme is you know however many miles away and no one wants to do that and Krispy Kreme is a fairly popular establishment that sells nice sugary donut treats so he went and did that and made loads of money naturally I think he might have shared it on social or something happened where um, Don, uh, Krispy Kreme was, was alerted to the number of donuts he was buying and essentially put the caboose in him and said that he couldn't buy a certain amount which I didn't get right because you know you're an entrepreneurial kid especially nowadays with the you know with the rising prices in, in college tuition and all that sort of stuff he looks like he comes from a minority background as well. It would have been a good story for Chris McKim just to kind of latch onto and to kind of like, you know, use him as maybe as a case study or use him in some kind of marketing promotional work or marketing material, sorry. But instead, these stiff, slow, um, out of touch companies decide to kind of put the caboose on him. They get loads of outrage on the internet because people are like, hey, how are you going to stop this kid from being entrepreneurial and doing what? Do I mean, there's no law stopping people from buying donuts, all this sort of outrage. And actually, guess what? They re they rescind the decision and they then, I think, supply him with a van or some shit. I read an article, but let's read it now. But I'm just thinking, like, why do these companies always do the wrong thing first before they do the right thing? It doesn't make any sense, especially nowadays. Don't they have anybody in their offices who's like the, um, uh, who's like the, what you call? You know how some some companies on Twitter have like a very fun way to kind of interact with their with their kind of customers or consumers. They kind of you know Twitter's a bit more of a reckless place. They kind of you know sometimes the KFC and Burger King account will go at each other. You know that kind of stuff. Like and obviously that means there's somebody on their social media team who's very much in tune with that you know with Twitter speak. Uh, with internet slang, with just general pop culture stuff. So why don't they have somebody in these companies who's the kind of the the cultural thermometer, the cultural touch point, the one that's like 
got their finger on, you know, got their finger up in the air, kind of feeling the temperature, seeing where the wind blows, and then kind of, you know, reacting um, as needed. Because if if that was the case, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't ban this kid. You just let him do do his thing. But again, what do I know? Let's read the story first of all before I start raging out. Um, let's get it on here. Come on, son. There we go. So, college student who resells Krispy Kreme donuts as a side job is awarded with a new van. Excellent news. So it says the following here. Um. This is from Fox News, of course, because they are going to report on this one. This, um, the, this entrepreneur's luck just keeps getting sweeter. A Minnesota college student who turned a city's love of Krispy Kreme into a side hustle and who was briefly banned by Krispy Kreme. So he was banned for reselling the donuts before the company changed its tune and awarded him an independent operator title. As now been given a new uh, Daimel delivery van to make his operation run a bit smoother. Each weekend, Jason Gonzalez, 21, will drive 540 miles round trip from Minneapolis St. Paul to Krispy Kreme store in, in Clive, oh, uh, Iowa. Where the hell is Clive, Iowa in that minute simple, simple? Let's see that on the map. I'm not even sure how far that is. United States distances are always a bit weird, isn't it? Let's see if we can find out how far this place is and where this guy is traveling to. But yeah, like, honestly, well, they always have to do that. Chris, like, they always have to just do the wrong thing to the right thing. Just do the right thing from the beginning and no one's going to care. Do you know what I mean? But he loves to do some dodgy stuff. So anyway, let's, this is Minneapolis St. Paul's in the United States. And now, through the power of Google Maps, we're now going to do directions. We're going to click that, right? Is that what we're going to do? Click directions. And then we're going to go back to the article and then we're going to copy and paste this place, Clive, Iowa, wherever that is, right? And we're going to see how, how, what distance is that? Is, that is, there, is he going across or is he going down? Let's see how far he's going. Holy shit. That's a long way. He travels what? So by what what's that by car? Fuck off. It's a three hour round trip. Well, six hours trip back and forth. That is insane. Okay, fair look, that's why I don't understand these companies. Can't you just look at this map and just say, okay, cool, this guy does like buy as many crispy coons as you want. That is insane. And if anything, he's essentially proved he essentially done the market um, research for you, right? There is a de demand and need for your Krispy Kreme treats because he's driving, like, I'm looking now on the map, right? From wherever he is in Iowa Clive until where the, the um, Twin Cities, Minnesota, where the Krispy Kremes is, it's a three hour and 40 minute drive, 254 miles. So he's, he's driving six hours and plus back and forth to get those donuts. There's not enough Joe Rogan podcast that'll make me want to do that on the weekend. That's pure entrepreneurial fucking um, thing, like gumption, isn't it? That's when you're really born to do it. You know when people say, oh yeah, some business, some entrepreneurship is a talent. Some people are like, oh no, you can learn that stuff 10,000 hours. No, no, no. No, no kid is going to risk their weekend, especially six hours either way to go pick up donuts, right? If they're not very much entrepreneurial leaning. Do you know what I mean? This is in his blood, mate. This kid's a fucking boss. Wow. Um, Gonzalez will then return to Minnesota, St. Paul area, and sell the donuts charging around $17 or $20 per box. That's pretty good. Boxes costing roughly $8 each before travel expenses. That's amazing. He's making basically double plus expenses on those boxes. Um, after his little business made headlines, Krispy Kreme asked Gonzalez to shut down his money-making scheme, citing product quality and regulatory compliance, which is fucking stupid. But the chain re re eventually um, came around and decided to help Gonzalez achieve his goals, which include being debt-free when the graduates of 2021, and in part by selling Krispy Kreme donuts. What a great story. So, see, this is, this is a story that these guys don't understand. It's made, it's a fucking bit of content wrapped up in a nice bow, right? Given, it's those kind of content that's put, it's, it's not even putting one of those shitty birthday presents bags where they kind of stuff it with tissue at the top no somebody is actually went 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 home got a nice bit of wrapping paper plopped it in the middle and did some nice japanese folding nice clean lines no creases use some invisible cellar tape or whatever cellar tape they use it doesn't make it look like it's masked on it nice pins a nice ribbon put a card on the inside sprayed it with scents and handed it to you this is what he's given to him he's given to him a marketing plan on a fucking plate all they gotta do is track this kid, maybe make another account, maybe make a little hashtag, right? And then do a catch up, a, a video in between, a video when he graduates, and then a video kind of like saying that, oh, now he's been hired as the area manager for Krispy Kremes, I don't know, Minnesota or some shit. That would be an amazing story. Done, still is delivered. But maybe it's talking about it now. Maybe they had to reject him in the beginning to make the story more interesting that, you know, he got rejected from the dance and now he's been chosen. But you don't need to do that. Just pick him from the start. Say yes. 
oh, this kid's amazing, it's entrepreneurial, retweet him, share his story, and allow him to kind of go in and prosper. But instead, they kind of say no, wait for the outrage, and then say yes after. And then again, you can't... Is it dumb? I don't know, man. These people are weird. Um, so this is the following in part by St. Crispy Green Donuts. Um, they, so, we are, so we are happy to work with Jason as an independent operator, um, ensure consistent delivery of our high quality donuts to our fans in Minnesota. Part of the statement for Krispy Kreme said, Now Gonzalez has been presented with a new set of wheels from Freight Waves, which partnered with uh, Dalmir to present him with the delivery van at the Freightway Live Conference in Chicago on Tuesday. Awesome. At the conference, the college senior explained that this his operation, which is run entirely from his small sedan, started when he went to Krispy Kreme Donuts for his girlfriend and decided to see if anyone else would be interested in purchasing. The treats from him, after posting on Facebook Marketplace, he said he received 500 replies from interested parties. Business Insider reported. Oh, my God. That's insanely good. That made me think, actually, about places around here, around where I live in Stratford, where there are certain places that aren't, aren't on um what do you call it they're not on uh uber eats or stuff but people want their food to get delivered there it would be fucking cool if i was have a ability to kind of post on there and say hey i'm selling a delivery service to kind of get these chicken burgers or chicken wings delivered to you because it's actually a really cool chicken wing spot next to where i live that's always got a queue going um uh, inside when you want to buy chicken in the street and if you know anything about Eastern, you know there's loads of chicken shops here so if there's one place that has a queue it's definitely good and it's you know one of the cleanest places the guy in there is super cool really good prices the product's amazing so it'd be quite cool to get people around here to kind of you know pay a little bit of a premium to get a chicken the chicken wings and chips and shit delivered to their um um their apartments whatever it may be but this is a pretty cool idea quality idea from the kid involved i love it i love it i love it super entrepreneurial and again just goes to show that you know once you're down in your luck not down in your luck but when you kind of have no other recourse and you really want to you know you want to you want to go to college you want to support your lifestyle you have a girlfriend you have a car you know these kind of things it drives you to like doing things that you necessarily wouldn't do just through out necessity because no one else is going to give you any money i imagine with these named gonzalez he's probably mexican or some shit and i know like you know mexicans grow up the same way black people do you don't get any money from your parents you have a million siblings who are well more are, are way more deserving than you are of, of being able to take your girlfriend out to cinema and shit do you know what i mean so you have to make your own money and this is an amazing way to do it so yeah great story by this kid definitely recommend you check it out if you haven't already Mm-mm-mm-mm. and then other one we have here what's we have um hiding like the spammers this is an interesting article you know um you know instagram are now going to implement um are now going to roll out this new feature where they're going to be hiding the likes I think it was a conversation they probably had already started in-house, but it kind of came to a head when Kanye West was talking about the effects of likes on Instagram um, concerning with mental health. So it's been a constant conversation now. And I think in general, being a cynic that I am, I think this has more to do with the fact that Instagram is suffering from engagement. Um, I don't think there's many kids or many people um, using Instagram as much as they were in the past. So in order to drive engagement, um, Instagram is now trying to get away one of the biggest taboos, one of the one of the things that was kind of holding people back from posting loads of content on Instagram, which is likes. Because if you think about it, the reason why a lot of Instagrams popped up mainly was because you know some people wanted to keep their kind of influencer professional side of their profile separate from their going out and partying with their friends profile. But most of it had to do with the idea that you wanted to be able to upload stuff. That wasn't necessarily the most polished. Maybe it wasn't taken with the SLR. Maybe it wasn't brand endorsed. Maybe you didn't have the right outfit on. Maybe it was, you know, just whatever miscellaneous uh, pictures. You wanted to take them and upload them without having the, without feeling um, inadequate because you didn't get the likes that your other pictures would normally get. And and I think most influencers and most people that are obsessed with social media are probably the same people who check like you know every other minute how many likes their post got right they're hovering all over the fucking icons seeing how many likes they so many how many how many heart, heart emojis they have on each image and that obviously um then makes people it makes the stakes for posting a lot higher so you then get that kind of you know that kind of paralysis by analysis thing you start to kind of um think overthink how you, what you're going to post and then eventually you end up posting on a, on a Instagram, which is usually private. There's no way of, of Instagram really getting anything from your private account in that respect. Um, it's kind of in a, in a walled garden. So Instagram, I think what they're doing with this hiding likes thing is basically changing the way people upload. It's going to make it, it's going to go back to the old, the, the, the hope is it goes back to the old days where people used to upload whatever. Like my, I've still got some of my old, I've still got my old archive of Instagram images that I'm probably going to print someday and put into a little zine and just have it for myself. But I remember I used to just upload shit on Instagram, like Facebook uploads back in the day. Just used to upload whatever. Whatever I had on my phone, took a picture of my fucking feet, of my hand, of a pencil sharpener, 
of a sky. I didn't care. I just uploaded wherever. It's just like a visual diary for me, right? And I think that's what they want it to return to. And I think with hiding likes, people are going to be able to post memes a lot easier. People are going to post videos, post random clips, random slideshows. It's just going to drive the engagement up. But this other theory that Business Insider has is that the whole idea behind um, um, Instagram hiding the likes is because they want to stop the, the slew of um, Instagram influencers kind of scamming the site. Um, which is weird. I never, I never really knew this was a thing. But again, you know, there's a market for everyone. The headline of Business Insider says the following: It says some Instagrammers are scamming their followers by flaunting wealth they don't have, and the problem could get worse if the problem, if the platform implements its hidden likes. So this is the opposite. Actually, I said they actually think if they hide the likes, it's going to be worse, which I don't really understand. But anyway, let's let's read this. Um, since February, an Instagram account called uh, Baller Busters has been calling out these fraud calling out these frauds which is dubs uh, flex offenders self in self-identifying entrepreneurs who show off a fake lavish lifestyle to sell young follow services like mentorship programs or online classes reported by taylor lorenz for the new york times so i guess there is a whole slew of new generation of ty lopez's around ty lopez is i think still a solid dude i think i have to credit him a lot with the reading um when when i started listening to ty lopez at the beginning i don't listen to him anymore but the the one thing i got from him was this idea of like soaking in all the knowledge from these books um, that's your mentors you don't need to go and reach out to people and get them coffee you can buy their books and read you know kind of learn from their mistakes learn from their successes and apply that to your own life and of course you know the value of a book you know 20 dollars or 20 pounds and you get a couple of lessons from it from somebody that's super successful you would never kind of cross paths with in your everyday life makes that book a whole lot worth it so i've got a lot of time for him in general but you know some of his um the way he does business can probably rub people up the wrong way but it seems that there's a whole generation of kids now who are taking that methodology and kind of like extrapolating it and going to it from the t so the article continues these services can cost thousands of dollars but aspiring entrepreneurs end up paying for bad advice lorenz wrote adding that some scammers hire subcontractors to teach their own classes which is fucking awful isn't it? so the influencers are front then he gets other people who are actually successful to then come and teach their course. Um, Lorenz calls them new breed scammer. Typically men whose Instagram profiles consist of corporate headshots, avatars, large followings, um, possibly purchasing a feed of cars, money and jets. After, pro after a process that involves everything from examining legal filings and screenshot messages from these from those who said they've been scammed to taking an industry, talking to industry experts, Baller Busters typically bust the scammer on Instagram stories, Lorenz wrote. We're not TMZ or a view page. We actually do investigate journalism. The account administrator told her. Um, Instagram is all about bragging and influencing, which I don't really agree. In millennials are giving money a new look. According to uh, Larissa Four in a place, piece in Forbes, they will vacation at Bifa with their buddies or fly to New York for a weekend. Andrew writes, and they see the richness in the storyline, in the storytelling of having an experience rather than buying one of expensive things, which is true. But I think that's more so for everybody. I think the popularity of Google flights, kayak, Skyscan, all these places, um, budget airlines for the most part are, you know, there's never a time when you go to Stanford Airport on a Ryanair flight that's never fucking completely jammed. I think most people are leaning more towards experiences. Maybe the ad, the kind of rise in popularity of festivals in London has been a big thing, but that's not really an indication that people are showing off on Instagram. People want to people want to live interesting lives. The li li world, the world already is in a bit of a fucked up place. So I think if there is an increase in people kind of really enjoying the free time that they have then i think that should be encouraged because you know if they kind of focus on what they see in the metro every day while they're going to work they're going to blow their brains out in it so if people can have some kind of escapism through other people's feeds if, even if it is bought or it is made up so be it um Da, da, da. and it continues um look no further than rich kids of Insta of the internet rkoi to see the extent of which is insta instagram has become a blagging platform um these feeds are filled with uh, everything from luxury cars and yacht trips to luxury beach vacations but who knows which of these kids is actually rich and who cares really and if you're going to follow RK rkoi rich kids of instagram then you're doing it because you just want to have a peek into other people's lives isn't it see what how the the other the, the your neighbors are living because this is usually something you don't necessarily... This is probably one of the sick things, awesome things about the internet. You never really had an idea about what actually the day-to-day -day lives of a rich person is like. And you can actually legitimately follow somebody who's legitimately wealthy, who doesn't need to work, and see what they get up to every day. It's quite, it might be quite interesting if you're that way inclined. I don't have any interest in it whatsoever. You know, I actually have loads of things that I'm actually more concerned about day-to-day. -day. But if, you're, if that's your form of entertainment, what's, what's, who am I to judge? Uh, more fake influencers could pop up on Instagram. Uh, wealthy millennials are taken to social media not just to flaunt their riches, um, 
Business Insider says, but to exert influence over trends. Influencers clout is increasing and it's shifting the power dynamic of the luxury world according to Mark Beck. Mm, I don't think that's true. Rise of Instagram means that display of wealth and extended influence has created a perfect cocktail in which flex offenders can thrive and the more fake influencers could pop up now that Instagram is considering hiding likes on post. Um, this Instagram began testing. I don't think that's true because I still think there is an element. If you're going to work with a brand and a brand wants to work with you, they're obviously going to ask you to take a screenshot of your analytics, right? Or maybe there's going to be an option where third parties can have kind of a snapshot of your analytics with some of support. They're going to get some info on you. And numbers speak louder than words. You might be able to get away with scamming or finessing a couple of brands here and there, but the word will spread. You don't really have the influence you speak about, that you're a bit of a no that you're a bit of a blagger, and then you, you stop getting deals. So it, it's, it's, it doesn't really have much ground to work with in that respect. And also, I think, if you look at the Jenners, or the, or the Kardashians, sorry, um, Kylie Jenner, Kendall Jenner, and you look at them and their friends, I think the actual opposite is true. I think most kids who are that rich are trying their best to look are trying their best to maybe position themselves, not to look, maybe to position themselves with people who are, who are generally not as wealthy as them, but are far more interesting and have far more legitimate influence. There's no coincidence that somebody like a Kendall or Kylie are hanging out with Tyler and these kind of people because that's where um, that's where the that's where it's fun, that's where the funds are and that's where the actual opportunities are and the good times are if you're that person, right? Because you get to hang around with real people. And for the fans watching you, they also get to imagine, oh yeah, that person must be cool if they're friends with that person because you know that person's legit as fuck. So I think if anything, most rich, there is a separation. There is probably an area of Instagram where the rich flaunty, you know, protect on your wrist um, over, you know, over the steering wheel of a Bentley, you know, with your shoes that are Gucci down below pictures. Those exist, but the wide majority of kids nowadays, I think in my experience, Try, especially if you're really wealthy, they want to position themselves next to the movers and shakers of, of actual culture and put themselves in those kind of spaces. That makes sense. But I'm just thinking about this actually with influencers. Do you think some cars, I'm looking at this Mercedes G-Wagon, do you think some cars' interiors are designed in a way that allows the driver to take selfies? Especially like of your wrist and your hand and the steering wheel. Do you think they, they purposely engineer or they purposely design the seats and the dashboard and where the and where the and where the, the steering wheel is and maybe it's adjustable so that you can actually get your wrist and your fucking shoe in the same shot? That is nuts if true in it. Imagine if that's the actual thing they do to make sure everyone kind of is able to see the badge of your car and stuff like that is nutty. Because you see that oh, quite often, isn't it? The badge, the or that picture with the R R on the back of the seat. Everyone does that thing where they kind of lean to one side so you can see the stars on the, on the roof and you can see the back of the stack. Jesus Christ, man. There's nothing more cringy than that, isn't it, really? Um, but again, you know, I used to post pictures of my trainers, you know, staring down from the bottom back in the day. And I, and I think that is ridiculous as well. But, you know, people do what they got to do in that respect. Um, but, yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with the, with the hidden likes thing. I still think... I still think it came from maybe a, a good place from Instagram. I don't think it was mostly a commercial thing. I just think they wanted more people to use the app. I think they've seen, like myself, I hardly use it. Um, um, and I think they have seen that and they want to kind of, uh, they want to kind of jump, encourage people to start using it again. I know when they start hiding likes, I'm going to jump back on it and I'm going to start posting bears. Um, not because I care about likes, but because, you know, I just want to just jump back on again when they hide likes. It would just be funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's see what happens, man. It might, again, it might encourage people to be a bit more creative on Instagram too, because it's going to be stale at the moment, isn't it? Which is why I probably snapped, I mean, that's probably why TikTok has come in and kind of stolen marching them. It's going to be stale. So hopefully they can kind of, you know, get a kick up the ass they need. And I also saw online too, um, Instagram are going to, uh, they're, they're kind of debuting a TikTok-like feature that they're kind of trialing somewhere which is, you know, sad, but it always happens with apps. So they're going to essentially kill TikTok app um, in one fell swoop when they kind of take it on. But we never know. Maybe TikTok might live on in the same way that Snapchat has. Snapchat didn't die. We, 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 we thought Instagram stories would kill Snapchat, but it's still around. It's still, you know, maybe hanging on for dear life, but it's still surviving in some respects. So let's see. Let's see what happens. That's one side of it. What else is on here? I have Liam Payne, mental health issues. Uh, this is a bit of a weird one, isn't it, really? Um, don't know much about Liam Payne. Don't know much about Odd One Direction. But it did get me thinking that, you know, I think it's what? Is it three out of four people from One Direction have this, have suffered from some kind of mental health issue? The Zayn guy, Liam and Harry Styles have all gone through their periods of, you know, um, you know, of drama um, in the public eye and also mental health issues um, that they've kind of, um, spoken about quite openly there's got to be something about 
uh, being a celebrity or being a pop star on that level, especially them, you know, they're fucking, you know, teenage heartthrobs. There must have been some level of pressure that it's just something that not a lot of people can deal with. Because that is really weird, isn't it? Three out of the five kids in that band, One Direction, and they're not, they're, I don't think they're over 25, if anything, right? They may be all under 26, have all gone through some really traumatic experience or a series of traumatic experiences all in the public eye. Um, this Liam guy is talking about being a father with Cheryl, who's like, I don't know how old she is and how old he is, but, you know, maybe he has no business being a father at this time and period of his life, but he had to deal with a newborn and all that stuff. That's a lot, man. It's a lot. And again, I don't have much to say about this. I don't know what to say about it. I've kind of put it down as a list of options to talk about, but this whole story is quite a lot. He does speak about it quite openly in this article for the Metro if you want to check it out. Um, it's really strange to see him standing. It's Cheryl, like... I know love it holds no game, but Jesus Christ, mate, that's a madness, isn't it? But then again, you did see quite a lot of people in my school back in the day when I was in school. Well, yeah, even nowadays, a lot of the girls in school that were super hot who kind of grown up to be mums and stuff, and, you know, they're still pretty, but, you know, back in the day, you were like, those are the only girls you saw. So for any, so for me, so in my experience, they kind of look at like Victoria's Secret models, which they probably didn't, but, you know, again, you don't see many girls when you're that age. You don't travel much. You just got your own little bubble. So the girls that you see in your school, are uh, the hottest things that you know since sliced bread so i remember a lot of the girls in my school tend to go for older guys and you see them come by after work after after well they probably pop down after work but they come by after school and they just look like i don't know they look like my dad but you have no you have no um you don't have any perspective because when you're a kid you think everyone above everyone just two years above you is like an old man so they probably were about 25 24 but it's just like you usually think like jesus christ man like how the hell you never used to make any sense and they always used to be lips and hardcore outside of school. That's what the first thing you'd see. You just see this older dude just fucking snug in the face of this younger girl. You'd be feeling, like now of, of course you'd be jealous. Like, oh, if I just kick this guy in the nuts and I could steal her away from her, but you also just be thinking like, wow, like how you just be looking at how big he is compared to the girl. Like usually, because back in the day, the girls weren't you know they weren't built like the girls they have nowadays who are kind of you know fed you know, uh, GMO products and shit, and they're fucking huge, but most of the girls in my school were quite, they look of age, they look like, they look, they look at their age, so it's always kind of sprung me a surprise, but then again, you know, I think it's a standard thing in kind of, you know, fucked up neighbourhoods like mine, or in Newham in general, right, you'd always get that kind of weird disparity in kind of relationships, because, you know, there is no, there's not a lot of people around, so you just do what you have to do with who's around, but yeah, that's strange, wasn't it, but I guess if you're a celebrity, it's different, Liam in his picture doesn't look, he doesn't look young, he looks quite older, isn't it? he's got shaved head, low hair, tattoos on his hands and shit but i don't know man that's a weird one that is a fucking weird one imagine being a dad at that age with a grown woman like this and having to go through all that it's just like that is insane but you know everyone's got their things to do but yeah check that out if you're that way inclined just thought it was interesting to see that you know three of the five members of one direction have gone through mental health issues and i remember he did, didn't zane during i remember i watched i must have watched that was a, maybe the last x factor that i watched or whatever when they got together and I remember Zayn leaving. Do you remember that episode? He actually didn't want to be in One Direction, even from the beginning. And then they convinced him to be in it because, oh, it's a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I think his family convinced him and he eventually he came back, right? Um, he probably still regrets that nowadays if you probably spoke to him, innit? <laughs> he probably says, I, pro I probably should never have gone. I knew it even back then. But yeah, man, bloody hell. Deep, deep shit. Um, next on the list... What else do we have here? Da, 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 da. Should we talk about Nate? No, not Nate, not Nate. Oh, Mike Tyson's a bit nuts. This is a funny little, just just a funny soundbite that I heard from Mike Tyson's uh, Hotbox podcast. You'll find out why it's funny in a minute, but it's going to play now. See, my, see man, let me tell you something, man. man. This is... um. Mike, I forgot his name. I knew I had a problem, dude. But he's talking about like, his problem with you know, uh, the thing is, people say, man, look. to Mike Tyson, and hear Mike Tyson's reaction to him talking, you know, quite sincerely and openly about his issues with pornography. <laughs> pornography, hey man, it's natural. Or like you know, I'm a man, so no, it's I natural. Think, I don't know, no, that's but, interesting. I have to comment on that. But that's what people say. They say it's natural, right? Because um, I don't know because that make I want to do weird stuff with my wife. My wife thing looks at me weird sometimes. Yep. I want to do some weird shit. Yep. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I guess that freaked out a little bit. Yep. Tell you, stop watching it. Stop watching because I know she stuck. And I guess my my son or somebody one day came by, look, use my phone, saw porn on the phone. Yep. And shit. So, yep. Yo, imagine seeing porn on your dad's phone. Just imagine that. Thank God we didn't have smartphones when I was younger. If I if I would have saw some fucking african big bum oily shit on my dad's phone i would have jumped off the side of i would have jumped out of my window 
Honestly, I would have gone upstairs slowly and really confidently said, not said a word, closed up my door and just jumped out. Like, you know that meme where you just like the guy got to the ledge, like, um, like Tommen. Is it Tommen from Game of Thrones? We'll just open the window and just like, just drop down. That's what I would have done. Honestly, this guy is nuts, bro. Imagine the kind of nasty, freaky shit Mike Tyson watches as well on his, on his smartphone. <laughs> he's a legend. I say legend. Oh, I just had to stop. We got really out of hand. So Dude, that. first of all, it, and I got tired of my dick was always scabbed up from jerking off. <laughs> bro, skin off my dick. Right. Bro. My skin is all peeled off, man. I fucking can't fuck, can't do nothing. Ah, you took ah, it's all sore. Hey, hey. bro, 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 bro. Did I? Is it me or did I automatically picture what Mike Tyson's hands must look like? Right, a professional boxer. He's he's had he's had a very interesting and colorful life. His hands are not going to be Nivea soft, right? There's going to be hands of fucking a, a, a professional fucking boxer. Somebody has paid to pummel their fist into the side of your face. And imagine that fucking hand scraping alongside his dick, having a wank in the morning. Ugh. He used to get scabs on his dick. That's how much he wanked. That's insane. That's insane. That's insane. There's some days I forget to fucking shit. There's some days I forget to piss, right? I forget to have a glass of water. Let alone wank. That's not the first thing on my list, like, of priorities. I wake up, oh, my God, I've got to have a wank. Like, imagine that kind of level of um, sexual frustration or the just porno pornographic addiction where you just have to get a nut off at any cost. You just have to do it. That's insane, man. I watched that video. I was like, oh, my God. There are, there's definitely levels to this freak shit. You know, sometimes you think you're, you're in your freaky bag. You think, yeah, you think, you know, yeah, girls aren't ready for me. Nah, there's some guys out there who are legit freaky, who are always on, always ready, just walking around with a woody, just looking for something to poke it into. Do you know what I mean? Just, you know, that kind of like cockney thing, like, oi, 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 little peacock. You know what I mean? Just wanting to push it in somewhere. You know what I mean? Whether it be a crevice of someone's armpit, the side of someone's bag, wherever it may be, they want to just push it in there. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, um, would I recommend you check out the video? Maybe if you want to, but not for me. Let's 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 switch and carry on. Oh my god! But yeah, I saw that and I was like, okay, cool, man. Mike, you're on another level, brother. You are on another level. Let's move on. Another topic here. What else do we have to talk about? Da, 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 da. Um, where is it? I want to talk about something here that I forgot about. Where is it? Da, da, da. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, cool. Yeah, Popeye stuff. You guys have seen the Popeye stuff, right? I'm pretty sure it's not big news. It's not new news for you guys. But the fight compilations of Popeyes are really funny. Um, but then, you know, it didn't get funny when someone eventually ended up dying, right? There's a story of somebody died at fucking Popeyes. This fucking chicken burger that everyone's getting insane about. And it's weird because I remember I went to, when I went to New York, 2007 or wherever, wherever whenever it was, we went to New York. Had an amazing time. Fucking loved it. And I ended up going to Popeyes, not because I knew what it was, but because it was just um, shiny. I remember it being lit up. You know, all the shops in fucking America, you know, they, they don't fucking scrimp on the LEDs. They, you know, they crank up that brightness super, super hard. So I just remember it just kind of screaming to me like a beacon from across the street. Walked over, went in and I realized, oh, this is, quite, this is the population that I've kind of heard about. You know, sometimes American spots, especially being a British dude or a British guy or somebody that doesn't live in America, there are things that you recognize or you know or you're very familiar with. Um, in American culture because you've you've absorbed so much of it through movies, films, whatever it may be, and literature, that sometimes you go there and you subconsciously, um, it, so, it jumps up from your subconscious, like, oh shit, this is where I am, I'm in this place. But at the time, you don't really realize it what you're doing it. Um, it's like when I drank a 40, I didn't necessarily make the connection with kids. That scene when Casper puts the, the 40 in his um, trousers, I was like, oh yeah, shit, that's that same drink that they were drinking in um, in, the, um, in kids. Um, the, the movie that kind of, you know, is eventually blew up and became the kind of bible for most supreme kids coming up nowadays or you know new skateboarding culture but anyway i remember going to popeyes and ordering uh, a box of chips and some ch chicken strips and one thing i remember that was a really cool experience was that that whole box of chicken strips and chips was something i shared amongst all our group of friends it was so fucking um not wholesome but it was so filling the chips were huge. The boxes, you know, usually your chicken boxes in in the U, in the UK, you get that kind of normal standard chicken box. And then sometimes, if you order like a big meal, they give you that bigger one. All of their big meals, all of their normal meals, were those bigger boxes, those kind of extra large ones that you sometimes get. Like it was insane, and that was just full to the brim with shit inside it, right? 
and I remember eating it and not and just not being able to finish it. Like it's, I just can't finish this, right? So and it's not even like a not finish this in like a oh I'm I'm only gonna eat salad today way. No, in a legitimate I cannot finish this. If I if I try and finish this, I'm gonna shit through my nostrils. So I remember sharing it with my friends, and you know it went around really well. Everyone was enjoying it, and then you know so it's quite funny to like see now nowadays that. The same place that again it wasn't that full, it wasn't that busy. I'm not gonna lie. I, I remember I remember Chipotle being really busy at the time we went there. That might have been <clears throat> during the kind of <clears throat> infancy of Chipotle, but I remember that being more busy. <clears throat> so I can't even say that there was hype around Popeyes. But it's interesting to see that now one burger can change a whole entire um, restaurant's kind of fortune. And it's strange because America still has Chick-fil-A, which obviously only operates on some locations around the US. But there's obviously other places that you can go to to get chicken burgers, right? Um, so it's just interesting to me why a place that isn't that popular to begin with in Popeyes has now suddenly introduced one item and it completely blew up. And if you read between lines on the internet, supposedly the recipe is not as good as it was when the first time around because they had one, they had the first kind of drop and then it kind of sold out and they couldn't get enough chicken or didn't have enough buns and then it drops again and that's supposed to be the all the things been changed. It doesn't, it doesn't even look that good from the images on the internet when I've seen it. It just doesn't. It looks like a standard chicken burger with pickles in it. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm not too sure. Maybe it's just me, but there's this really um, funny off. No, funny, you know, funny is a. Oh, they took it off the internet now. It's gone. I had a video, a fight compilation of um, Popeye stuff that somebody's removed on here. But you know what can you do? But there's now like a video here that says about some. There's a, this is a report about somebody dying at the Popeyes, right? Yeah. I don't think it's the actual video, is it? Fist fights, car crashes, even a murder. Yeah, this is going to sound pretty ridiculous, but all of that <laughs> is over a chicken sandwich. Some people are losing their minds over the newest offering from Popeyes. Greg Mills, seriously, a chicken sandwich. <laughs> Pat, Jeff, it <laughs> but should we be surprised though, really? Especially when you, when you think of the popularity of food trucks with the fact that, you know, there is obviously a demand for really tasty fried food because, you know, there's so many TV shows. Uh, how many... F food related tv shows are there on netflix at the moment there's too many too many to even watch in one lifetime so there's obviously a demand out there for people to watch these kind of shows you know um where essentially people are gorging themselves you know to death eating food that is covered in olive oil or deep fried or you know baked or some some nonsense compared some nonsense included in there so maybe it's not that far-fetched but again, I just it's just strange to me that considering just how big of a just how big of a nation America, the United States is, and how many places there are to eat. And you know, there's definitely people out there. There's definitely restaurants or bars and pubs, or you know, even hotels that probably do really mean burgers that you could go to that are kind of well known and kind of local favorite. So weird that this one chain is fine, it's fucking killed it like this. But you know, this is probably the power of marketing. It is unbelievable. I can't believe it. The line is out the door. I can't you see believe all it. The cars that are right here. It's been like this all it's been day insane. long. Insane. Queues yep. going. And this is where the hustle comes in if you're that Krispy Kremes dude because you're just going to keep ordering these things and selling them on fucking Facebook, right? Just not giving a flying fuck. I think I might do that, man, with the fucking chicken wings. Fuck it, I might give it a go. <laughs> Start selling chicken wings online. It's really good. I mean, it's worth it. Popeye's chicken sandwich. Man's sake, it's us. worth it. Worth a long wait in line. Like 30 to 45 minutes. Or at the drive through I've been here for about 20 minutes. But is there it's... anything that you've eaten recently that has actually lived up to that kind of um, expectation? I think the only only thing I can think of that was really good that, that I had that was amazing was when I went to In-N-Out in L.A. That was one thing that I kind of built, I kind of, you know, built up in my head. And when I went there, I was like, okay, this is the best burger I've ever had. I got the hype. But everything else has been like, yeah, it's cool, but it's not like, you know, I don't know. It's just cool, isn't it? Like Shake Shack. When it eventually came to London, I had it. Cool, but I was like, yeah, cool. There's nothing that's really kind of blown me away. So I can only imagine what it must take for somebody to drop, jump in their car in the middle of, I don't know, crazy traffic. Most of these Popeyes are probably located in very densely populated neighborhoods and go and queue on a drive through for Popeyes and then have the added danger that someone might stab you in the neck if you jump in front of them in a queue. Is it worth the wait for this crunchy chicken sandwich if you crunch your car in the process? Yeah, these guys are all insane. Is this chicken sandwich worth a life? A man was killed after cutting line in Maryland just to get one of these chicken sandwiches. If you want to go in front of me, go ahead. I ain't tripping. I exactly. ain't gonna lose my life over chicken sandwich. Yeah, Check that's out. insane. But yeah, so many fights and whatever it may be. Again, maybe there's a lesson learned there. Don't jump in front of people in queues. There's nothing that drives me more insane. It actually got me thinking about just, you know, service in general in restaurants or in places. There is a shop or supermarket near where I live which will remain nameless 
where the person that works in there that that looks after the hot deli place where I go get my chicken fries and stuff for my chicken salads, he's never there on time. He's always late, or whenever I'm there and he's prepared the stuff, he's never at the station. It just drives me nuts. There's nothing I hate more than really bad um than people that are really bad at their job, especially people that work in the service industry. Because most of the time, there's this common understanding between the customer and the employee that you both don't want to be there, right? Especially like, imagine the the Monday, the Monday after Sunday, right? Um, after work. No one wants to do... Imagine you haven't done your shopping during the weekend and you decide to do it after work on a Monday. You're going to be met with everybody else in the whole fucking country who decided to go there too because everyone else is lazy. So it's fucking rammed. No one wants to be spending their Monday after the first day back at, at work or after the weekend in a shopping center. So just make the experience easy, right? I don't want to be here. You, you don't want to work here today because you've got the worst type of people in, in the shop. But some some employees don't give a fuck they're just gonna they're just gonna exasperate the issue turn it into some sort of beef and then suddenly you guys have this weird back and forth argument over what a couple of chicken wings it makes no sense and this guy just silently drives me nuts he's sometimes you stand at the fucking deli station and there's no one there and what makes it even more infuriating is people around you right working doing again they're not they're not working on the deli they're doing the other stuff they might be working on the butcher stand or working in another place but they make no indication to try and get their colleague to come out because, you know, they just, they just, they just assume their colleague's going to come out when he comes out. There's no um, thought, there's no kind of thinking about the customer. Oh, shit, this guy's been waiting for ages. Let's try and see if our colleague is in the toilet or something. Or I don't know, on the, in the, in the, in the probably in the staff room looking at his phone. Because I know if I was working there, I'd be doing the same thing. But I don't know, be clever, man. Like, use your common sense. I don't know, like, maybe do it towards the end of the day. In the beginning of the morning when you know everyone's going to be in there popping in before they go to work. Why don't you just stay at your station? It's the one thing that kind of annoys me sometimes. Sometimes I think looking at these fights at Popeyes, some of it can be, you know, it's stuff that you don't encourage. But there is this episode of me where it's like, I'm sure some of the times it's like the people in there have, have waited long enough as it is. So they're already kind of, you know, running on thin ice in terms of patience. Um, you know, you're in a hot place full with fucking, you know. Um, the smell of fried food all over the place, not much ventilation, everyone's kind of agitated and wanting to get the fuck out of there so they can get go and eat their burger. So if anything, the staff members should be trying to kind of really kind of simmer everyone down, not responding to people at their level of kind of annoyance. And sometimes, you know, if the if the staff people are taking ages to make the burgers and they're walking around and they do that thing where they kind of drag their feet all on the floor and stuff, it just can drive you nuts as a customer because you're like, come on, man, I know this job is shit, but if you... If you act like if you're kind of slumping your shoulders and acting like a shithead and not wanting to help anyone, it's just gonna make the job even harder. And I've worked service job industry. Honestly, I know what it's like to be working on the shop floor on Boxing Day, right? I know, I know how bad it is, but you you have to make it worth your while. You have to make it fun. You have to make it go by quickly because the moment you don't, you could eventually you could end up snapping on a five year old and punching him inside the face because he told you to shut up or something. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to do that. But yeah, man, these videos are fucking insane. Um, Americans are another breed, really, isn't it? You get to see just how different Europeans and Americans are. I don't think you could this would ever happen in any European um, eating establishment, even if the item that was on the list was really nice. The most you will get is some kind of argy bargy in the queue. Oi, oi, get out of use my space. Oi, I was there. You'll get all of that, but you're not going to get people stabbing each other. I don't think so. That's insane. You wouldn't. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it depends, depending on where the restaurant is. If the restaurant's in the middle of Brixton, or somewhere around Forest Gate in Stratford, or Plaster and shit, maybe something different, but I, I don't know, I don't think you're going to get that, I think most people are just going to just let it lie, and just keep it moving, innit, because, come on, really, I'm not going to argue about you for a chicken burger, innit, really, that's not, not the vibe, not the vibe at all, um, what else do we have here, da 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 da, oh, they're opening a, a solo house in Hong Kong, are you guys familiar with Hong Kong, do you guys care about Hong Kong, I know they're having a, those riots over there at the moment now which are fucking insane which you know probably might affect the way they open this um, um hotel in the first place but it looks absolutely gorgeous um i think it's their first expansion into the into the far east right i'm pretty sure right um this is an article from high snob it nick jones 10-year journey to open so house in hong kong um so house founder nick jones has a knack for perfectly curating the club's um, outposts around the world currently boasting 28 locations so house latest in hong kong is a 28 story skyscraper in sen wang in shuang wan with views over hong kong island victoria harbor and victoria peak there is places in hong kong called victoria harbor and victoria peak that's some colonialism there isn't it was amongst the most challenging builds ever the house includes a pool room drawing room 
house brazier, private dining rooms, three floors of Soho active gym, and nine floors of Soho works. There's a three floor gym, mamma mia. Additionally, Kate Bryan, head of collections of Soho House, amassed an impressive permanent collection, including arts from Lee Kit, Tan Lee Kit Sang Wan, and Fry's Lai, alongside key historical material from the past generations, including Ho Fan, Yang Luang, Wang Wuk Bik, and Choi Yan Chi. Following the opening of Soho House Mumbai last year, this is the second house in Asia. Okay, awesome. And the first in East Asia. Um, when he caught up with Jones, he was both overjoyed with the final product and clearly relieved that the 10-year journey had come to fruition. This is awesome. That's Nick Jones. I've, I've, I've seen him a couple of times at Shoreditch House um, here and there. From the interviews I've seen online, the, the guy he seems like a per perfectly decent chap. So I definitely recommend you check it out. Hong Kong, Hong Kong Soho House. Might be a pretty cool place to go and visit and check out. Oh, look at that. It's got a disco ball above the swimming pool. Is that a swimming pool? Or is that like a little dipping pool thing? That's insane. The parties in there are going to be insane. Imagine what the opening party was like, actually. That must have been really cool. They've got like a, is that a roasted duck or roasted turkey. I don't know what that is. Braised, maybe. With a nice drink on the side there. It looks fucking gorgeous. There's a dude there with his top off looking over the balcony because why wouldn't you do that? The, air, the, the the clouds don't look the nicest, do they? They're full, full of fucking smog, but I still wouldn't say no to a, a little stay over there, man. It looks fucking gorgeous. Yeah, congratulations to Soho House Group for that new location. It looks absolutely blinding. There's a disco ball above the swimming pool, mate. You know how insane that is? Oh, there's a slideshow here. Let me see some other pictures as well. Oh, nice reception. 28-story 28, 28, um, place, man. That is insane. That's really cool. And again, I'd imagine, I I wonder what the private members club scene is like in Hong Kong. Is it the same as the UK or in London? Do people uh, prefer to go there apart from going to like bars and clubs, maybe to do business or whatever, maybe? Maybe it's a substitute for a co-working space. That's a gym in it, right? Oh, loads of punch bag. It looks incredible. Bloody hell. They know how to do the interior design of solo houses, isn't it? They look really, really breathtaking, I think, in my eyes. Considering just how many outposts they have all around the world, each of them, they each have their own kind of visual identity, but there is some kind of cues that you can kind of get, you know, the warm browns, the use of woods in general, for the most part, the tones, the textures. There are some things that kind of would make it, a, you'd make, you'd, you would know straight away, even if someone didn't tell you that that was a solar house group place, <clears throat> even just looking at the pictures. <clears throat> wow, the restaurant looks incredible as well, isn't it? Look at that. Beautiful place. But yeah, definitely recommend check it out. Solar house article. There's an entire interview here. I won't bother bore reading it to you but it's titled nick jones 10 year journey to open Soul house hong kong <clears throat> i'll link in the show notes for you guys listening via the podcast app and watching via youtube so let's move on let's do one last one before i jet off what else we have here du, 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 du. oh salt bay is coming to london as well have you heard about that salt bay is coming to london salt bay mr salt bay is coming here so this article from eater Supposedly he's opening up a burger restaurant, which is, um, you know, wasn't aware he was in the market of burgers. I, I thought he just did kind of, you know, your quintessential Turkish cuisine, but this is not true. So Salt Bay wants to open a burger restaurant in London, it says here. Um, it's understood the internet sensation and international celebrity will open on Mount Street Mayfair. Of course he would. Um, the butcher turned salt sprinkling Instagram sensation N Nuzret Gok uh, Gokshi or also known as Salt Bay will make his London debut not with the nursery steakhouse on London's King's Nightbridge as previously widely reported okay cool that's that's the first news we thought he was going to come and bring his restaurant to Nightbridge that, we, that steakhouse that he kind of has where he's feeding people a steak in their mouths and shit so that's not going to happen uh, but with a burger restaurant his brand um, Nuzret Burger is thought to be opening on Mount Street Mayfair sometime in the new year. It understands that the international celebrity chef and personality whose brand value is perhaps best demonstrated by his 23 million Instagram followers. Fucking, I didn't know he had that many Instagram followers. That's insane. Well done, mate. We'll take over the site, formerly occupied by the Audley pub at 43, 41 to 43 Mount Street, uh, a strip which is home to the, uh, the Scott Seafood Restaurant, uh, the Cognate Hotel, and Christian Louboutin Boutique. Oh, great company, right? After you go buy your red bottoms, you can then go buy a burger or get this guy to kind of, what, sprinkle burger on top of the bun? What's he going to do? <laughs> but yeah, this is street. And the spokesperson for, for Salt Bay said, confirmed that the group had, would be opening the burger restaurant in London in Mount Street, but would not confirm the address. Um, the Salt Bay's expansion of burger division, um, most recently saw it open one in Dubai. It's been reported that it's been to one in New York shortly after. Um, but yeah, they don't fuck around in restaurants, isn't it? I, re I recognize that with um, uh, 
not piece of pills of pilgrims is a good example but frank and manka as soon as frank and manka got popular or even um there's a few others but they don't muck around they don't fuck around the restaurants when it comes to investments as soon as it works investment company comes in and they fucking launch the restaurants all around the place super quickly right dubai new york london bang 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 they don't mess around with expansion as soon as they know that it works and you've got uh you know a rabid fan base especially his i didn't imagine the cues for that Right, imagine the cues for that. That would be some real cues because people love Salt Bay in London, I think. Um, especially those Instagram influencer types. They're going to love wanting to have the guy, you know, sprinkle salt on their beef patty as they sit down and wait in it. Uh, I'd be interested too if he kind of introduces the Impossible Burger though. I know Turkish people don't fuck around with the non-meat alternatives. I know they don't really fuck around with that vegetarian shit. Maybe they do. I don't know. It'd be interested to see if, if like the vegans protest and decide to kind of push him in the direction of doing the whole you know, um, meat substitute burgers, which have now been proved to be um, extremely unhealthy, actually, since people are researching them a lot more. So definitely recommend check out that news. But yeah, Salt Bay wants to open up a burger restaurant in London. Let's see how that goes. Let's see if it's successful. Um, there's a, so much competition in the burger industry in London. It's just insane. Um, you know, even your standard gastro pub has a pretty decent burger on their menu. Uh, especially the independent ones they have they have you know visiting chefs or aspiring chefs going in the kitchen absolutely doing fucking bits in there and making some banging food so for him to come again but then thinking about it it's not really true because there are there is a certain population of people who just want to go to the coolest trendiest glitziest place i'm sure the interior design is going to be amazing in there they're going to have people coming out with fucking you know kebab sticks and shit cutting meat on the table and doing all that nonsense so i'm pretty sure people are going to love it regardless and it's, and it's obviously he's going to be there too isn't it 